Happy Labor Day week. Did unions really give us a 40-hour work week? What's in the news with stories on tariff trouble, bad cops, more bad cops, and even more bad cops, and poking the bear? Finally, a statist's going to state segment on John McCain. This episode is brought to you by Zencash, now known as Horizon, a cryptocurrency that infuses privacy, anonymity, and security done right. Also brought to you by Free Talk Live, providing you with fresh pro-liberty content seven days a week on more than 180 radio stations across the country. Welcome to The Lava Flow, channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week. From the state that was named after the town of Hampshire, England by English explorer Captain John Smith, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Rebellion needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 102, Labor Day, and it's Wednesday, September 5th, 2018, when there have already been more than 720 people killed by police this year. And the United States debt clock shows us at more than $21 trillion, $402 billion, $800 million in debt. What's rustling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. First, a bit of house cleaning. The site I've used for years for the number of people killed by police on my intro has shut down. It was the most accurate representation out there and included link sources for every single death, so it could be audited by anyone at any time. So now I have to decide if I'm going to remove that from the intro, since any other source I will use will not be as accurate, or if I just use a less accurate number. For example, the site I used, killedbypolice.net, showed 720 people killed up to July 1st by police. The closest I could find anywhere else is about 630. Quite a difference. Hmm, what to do, what to do. Let me know what your thoughts are. Also, I want to apologize for not getting an episode out the last couple of weeks. Things have been nuts for me, working on a massive project for a company I'm contracting with, plus working on my fourth audiobook after finally getting my third one out. I've been working 80-hour weeks. But things are slowing down a bit, so I should be able to get back to normal. Speaking of my third audiobook being out, you can get a copy now at thelavaflow.com slash homeschooling. The book is called Homeschooling, A Hope for America, and it's edited by Carl Watner, the guy behind the voluntarist newsletter and the book, Neither Bullets Nor Ballots. If you've ever considered getting your kids out of government indoctrination centers, then this is the book for you. Again, you can get your copy of Homeschooling, A Hope for America on Audible Audiobook at thelavaflow.com slash homeschooling. So let's jump into our Labor Day week episode on labor unions. The National Libertarian Party has two mentions of labor unions in their platform. The first is, we favor repealing any requirement that one must join or pay dues to a union as a condition of government employment. The second is, we support the right of private employers and employees to choose whether or not to bargain with each other through a labor union. While the National LP is not nearly as anti-government as I am, the first statement is just weak sauce. Their statement, we favor repealing any requirement that one must join or pay dues to a union as a condition of government employment should be changed to simply, we favor repealing all public sector unions. I mean, if you work for the government, you're already pretty much set for life, and you want the ability to hold the taxpayer hostage for more money and benefits stolen from them? Fuck no. Now as to the second statement in the LP platform. We support the right of private employers and employees to choose whether or not to bargain with each other through a labor union. I agree completely. I have a personal history with unions. My father is a member of Local 669, the Sprinkler Fitters Union, and it served him well. He was able to retire fairly young with a great monthly salary and benefits. However, I really remember those times when he was on strike for weeks, for a few pennies in his salary, but for much more power for his union bosses while we worried about where the money for food for the family would come from. However, the thing that drives me the craziest about unions is that they receive so much praise for bringing us the 40-hour work week. 
When economists and historians were surveyed, 88% of them either agreed or mostly agreed with the proposition that economic growth, not unions, was to be thanked for our reduced work week. In fact, only 5 to 6% thought that unions were the primary cause. In 1790, about 90% of workers worked in agriculture. They had almost no choice. People didn't have the luxury of ignoring food production. And until recent history, 40 hours of labor a week just wasn't enough productivity to feed a family. So hours were long and labor was arduous. Thankfully, as technology made it possible, fewer farms fed greater populations. And by 1990, the share of the labor force working in agriculture had dropped to only 2.6%. This decline occurred consistently throughout the decades. What's noteworthy is that freedom from these long hours and backbreaking labor didn't arise because someone passed a law mandating that everyone could stop working after only eight hours and still magically have enough food to feed their families. Rather, it manifested because increases in productivity allowed people to leave the farms. When people moved into manufacturing, they began working fewer hours over the decades. The average work week declined from approximately 70 hours in 1830 to about 60 hours by 1890. This, too, was the result of productivity increases, specifically the implementation of steam power. As a 2006 National Bureau of Economic Research study concluded, after observing historical trends in labor productivity, controlling for firm size, location, industry, and other establishment characteristics, steam-powered establishments had higher labor productivity than establishments using hand or animal power or water power. The diffusion of steam power was an important factor behind the growth of labor productivity, accounting for 22 to 41 percent of that growth between 1850 and 1880. In the 1900s, workweek hours declined again from around 55 to 60 hours to only 35 to 40 hours by 1938. In 1930, for instance, railroad workers worked an average of 42.9 hours per week. Coal miners worked an average of only 27 hours. Henry Ford implemented a 40-hour work week in 1926 because he believed that consumers with more free time would buy more products. Other large companies followed suit. Just one year later, 262 large companies had adopted five-day work weeks. For the first time, people experienced work-free weekends. This clearly demonstrates that the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, a decade later, which brought the legal forced 40-hour work week, was essentially unnecessary at least in regards to establishing a 40-hour work week as the standard. So despite the data showing a clear decline in work hours all occurring prior to unions having successfully lobbied Congress to legislate the 40-hour standard, people still mistakenly believe that unions were to thank for our 8-hour day and 40-hour work week. A graph from the study Trends and Hours, the U.S. from 1900 to 1950, shows the decline from 1830 to 1990. We had already reached the 40-hour standard by 1938 without the need for legislation. Also, as the study states, the decline was not even across workers. It benefited mostly low-wage earners who used to work the most in 1900. Labor unions have been trying for decades to legislate a shorter work week, but their goals simply weren't mathematically feasible until per capita GDP and productivity at first increased to allow for it. Once they did increase, the demands of unions were finally possible. This is far different, however, from falsely concluding that the union demands were the source of the advancement. Look, I think collective bargaining is not necessarily a bad thing. Where I draw the line is when labor unions use extortion and violence to get their way, which is a large part of the history of many unions. If people want to collectively come together to negotiate pay or benefits with their employer in a voluntary way, then have at it. But please, stop giving me that bullshit line that labor unions gave us the 40-hour work week. It is a myth. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In the fallout of tariffs news, the federal government will spend up to $1.2 billion to buy products from farmers hurt by the retaliatory tariffs from China and other countries, and will provide almost $5 billion in payments to farmers. The purchases and payments are part of an emergency temporary aid package for farmers that was announced in July to provide relief for producers who were hurt by the trade war with China and other countries. 
The government said it could spend up to $12 billion to offset the estimated damages from tariffs placed on U.S. goods as retaliation for tariffs President Donald Trump announced against China and other countries. The spending announced only represents the first phase of aid. Agricultural Secretary Sonny Perdue said farmers were already under economic pressure and tariffs couldn't have come at a worse time. USDA's chief economist said net farm income is down more than 20% since 2012 and that it's projected to go down even more. Purdue told reporters, These are the men and women who year after year put their equity on the line and assume the financial risk every time they plant a new crop. President Trump knows American farmers, ranchers, and producers are the ones who feed, fuel, and clothe not only this nation, but also the rest of the world. Farmers are patriots, and they support the president in his defense of the overall American economy, but it's a fact that they cannot pay their bills with simple patriotism. This is just typical. The U.S. government hurts farmers by starting a trade war, so the U.S. government bails out those farmers that they hurt with our stolen money. What the actual fuck? Maybe we should have open, free trade with all nations and let the market decide what is best instead of introducing policies that hurt our food production and farmers. This is just insanity. In Bad Apple news, a Texas jury on Tuesday found former police officer Roy Oliver guilty of murder and the shooting death of 15-year-old Jordan Edwards. Oliver, who was fired from the Batch Springs Police Department days after the shooting, faces life in prison after being found guilty of murder for firing his rifle into a car that carried five unarmed teens as they left a house party in April of 2017. The shooting killed Jordan, who was a passenger in the car. Jordan's father, Odell Edwards, said, I'm happy, very happy. It's been a long time, a hard year, but I'm just really happy. The jury also found Oliver not guilty on two charges of aggravated assault. Jurors had the option of finding Oliver guilty of manslaughter, which carries a lesser punishment of up to 20 years in prison, but they ultimately decided on the murder charge. Attorney Darrell Washington said the verdict was a symbolic victory for all unarmed black people shot and killed by police. Washington said, It's about Tamir Rice. It's about Walter Scott. It's about Alton Sterling. It's about every African-American, unarmed African-American, who has been killed and who has not gotten justice. You know, I hate that this has turned into a race issue. But in their defense, the vast majority of people killed by police are disproportionately black. That's just the facts. Oliver claimed he opened fire to protect his fellow officer, Tyler Gross, when the car with the boys got too close to him. Gross testified in court, though, that he didn't believe the car was trying to hit him. Gross said, I was in fear that the vehicle was close to me, but not in fear that the vehicle was trying to run me over. Good for this guy for being honest. Jordan's brother, Vidal Allen, was driving the vehicle and also testified that he wasn't trying to hit Gross. He said that he couldn't see an officer was yelling at him to stop the car. He said, I didn't understand that was a police officer at the time. I just wanted to get home and get everybody safe. It's refreshing to see a cop cross the thin blue line and testify that his fellow officer's actions did not match the reality of the situation. I'm very glad to see that, and very glad to see this very just verdict in this case. The sad thing is that this is the exception and not the rule. Zencash has changed their name to Horizon to better represent their transition from a pure cryptocurrency to a pioneering platform that protects consumer data. They're focusing more on the wider vision of what Zencash was all about. The new name, Horizon, reinforces that the project is forward-thinking and visionary and will broaden the horizons of what the community can accomplish in the world using the platform. Not only is it one of the best privacy-oriented cryptocurrencies with zero-knowledge technology built into it, but they also have private chat over their network. And soon, Horizon will include the ability to publish information and go anywhere on the web, all with complete privacy. They are working toward the day when anyone will be able to build privacy-based applications on the Horizon platform and generate income from them. This will allow Horizon to bring thousands of real-life services to the community. Services that provide freedom, utility, and privacy. The unique spelling of Horizon is a nod to their heritage and recognizes that they remain committed to the vision that their project was built upon. Their coin and ticker symbol remains Zen. So Zencash is now Horizon, and Horizon is bringing privacy to life. You can learn more at horizon.global. 
That's H-O-R-I-Z-E-N dot global. In Fuck the Police News, a federal judge told a Virginia sheriff's deputy that he had no right to pull over a car because a passenger flipped him off. After this, proceedings advanced in the lawsuit against Patrick County Lieutenant Rob Coleman. U.S. District Judge Jackson L. Kaiser had found sufficient evidence to bring the matter to trial. After Deputy Rob Coleman pulled Brian H. Clark over for extending his middle finger at him as he drove past, the deputy said, People do not wave inappropriate or obscene gestures to a law enforcement officer unless something is wrong. (laughs) Bullshit. Judge Kaiser openly mocked this observation. Judge Kaiser wrote, Tellingly, he does not allege that he ever asked Clark if he was safe or that he inquired anything of the driver, nor does he assert any other interaction throughout his entire career where an obscene gesture was displayed towards him in an effort to indicate duress or request police assistance. In his ruling, Judge Kaiser said, The evidence establishes that Coleman, acting in his capacity as a deputy sheriff, seized plaintiff without probable cause or reasonable suspicion of wrongdoing. The vehicle was stopped without probable cause or reasonable suspicion, and Coleman's expressed reason for stopping the vehicle is belied by the plaintiff's testimony, which I accept as true. Clearly, plaintiff has presented sufficient evidence to show that Coleman, acting under the color of law, violated the plaintiff's rights to be free from unreasonable seizures. At this stage in the case, the judge must review all the evidence in the light most favorable to Clark. He found Clark had shown a clear violation of his constitutional rights under the First and Fourth Amendments. Also in his ruling, Judge Kaiser said, Coleman still lacked any authority to seize him during a traffic stop, and a reasonable officer should have known that any seizure was in contravention of the Constitution. Coleman's claims of qualified immunity is rejected, and count two will proceed to trial against Coleman. And of course, the last sentence of this article said, Coleman has since been promoted to captain. God damn it. This is what I'm fucking talking about. An officer clearly uses his shiny badge to abuse the rights of an individual, a member of the public he is supposed to protect and serve, and the officer is fucking promoted. Fuck this cop and whoever promoted him in the neck. In more Fuck the Police news, the police chief of a small Georgia town is defending an officer who deployed a stun gun on a smiling 87-year-old woman saying she refused to comply with numerous commands to put down a kitchen knife that she was using to cut dandelions. But relatives of the octogenarian, Martha Albashara, say police failed to use good common sense to prevent the incident from quickly escalating to a use-of-force confrontation in Chatsworth that landed their diminutive matriarch in handcuffs. Albashara's grandson, Timothy Duane, a 24-year-old medical student, said, She told us she was smiling at them to tell them that she wasn't a threat, and she was trying to get closer to them to communicate with them, and that's when they tased her. My grandmother's a human being who they didn't have any patience with. What happened to Mayberry? Would you ever see Andy Griffith tase an 87-year-old woman? It points to a bigger problem with the lack of human interaction. But Chatsworth Police Chief Josh Etheridge said the officer had little choice but to use a taser on Al Bashara when she failed to obey numerous orders to put down the knife as the five-foot-two woman stepped towards them. He said there is police body camera footage of the incident, but he has yet to release it because charges against al Bashara are pending. She has been ordered to appear in court on September 19th. Etheridge said in a video statement, She came walking toward the officer. After multiple commands, he told her to stop several times. She continued walking, at which time we deployed the taser. The incident occurred on Friday afternoon after police received a 911 call from a staffer at the Boys and Girls Club saying, This lady is walking on the bike trail. She has a knife and she won't leave. She doesn't speak English. The caller told the dispatcher that the elderly woman did not threaten anyone with a knife. According to the 911 call recording, the caller said, She's old, so she can't get around too well. Looks like she's walking around looking for something like vegetation to cut down or something. Dwayne said his grandmother, who became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 2001, along with her 96-year-old husband, lives across the street from the Boys and Girls Club. He said his grandmother had gone into the property to collect dandelions to use in a traditional Arabic dish because none had bloomed in her garden. The grandmother was arrested on suspicion of misdemeanor criminal trespass and obstruction of an officer and held at the police station for about three hours. 
Police refused to allow his mother and sister to interpret for al Bashara while she was being booked and having her mugshot taken. Duane said that once his grandmother was released, relatives took her to a hospital to be treated for bruises and pain to the body. Duane said, She's still feeling pretty shook up. Her body is still pretty tired. She has some symptoms, I think, of post-traumatic stress. She can't go outside and look at the spot where it happened. She's feeling really bad about the whole situation and really embarrassed and has been crying on and off. This is just incredible, folks. So now, for misdemeanor trespass and the horrible crime of not speaking English, it's a legitimate tactic to employ force? Come on. This woman was no threat to anyone. She never threatened anyone, and even the non-police trained person who called 911 knew this woman was no threat. These cops should be fired immediately. The family has legal counsel now, and I hope they sue the shit out of this cop and the department. One of the largest reaching Liberty programs today is Free Talk Live, with a three-hour radio program seven nights a week on more than 180 radio stations across the country. They are so influential on talk radio that they are the number 27 radio program in the country, according to Talkers Magazine. They also have a daily podcast that's been voted Best Political Podcast five times by PodcastAwards.com. The hosts of Free Talk Live are street preachers for the ideas of liberty. They take the message of peace, liberty, and cryptocurrency to the masses on the radio, where they are not preaching to the choir. You can listen via podcast or live via audio streaming or the Twitch or YouTube channels at freetalklive.com. I listen to their podcast myself every single morning when I get up to get a fresh perspective on news and very, very strong libertarian perspectives. Make sure to add them to your feed at freetalklive.com. In Poking a Hornet's Nest, in a move Russian officials immediately labeled as unfriendly, the Norwegian Defense Ministry has announced that the U.S. will be more than doubling the number of Marines stationed inside Norway, bringing yet more combat troops to Russia's northern border. Officially, the U.S. says the troops are there for training purposes. Initially, this was presented as a chance for the Marines to learn how to ski in the event that they are at some point doing alpine conflict. Norway's officials similarly say this is not intended to target Russia. Yet, the U.S. has, for years, been adding more and more troops to countries all along Russia's frontier, and these deployments to Norway are expected to last at least five years, a long time to learn how to ski if they don't figure that might include skiing into Russia for a war. Pentagon officials are already backing away from the skiing narrative, at any rate, now saying that the troops are there for the defense of Norway which is neither in keeping with the training operation nor with the claim that this isn't an operation unrelated to U.S. hostility toward Russia. I assume this is being done to look tough against Russia with all the media reports of Russian collusion and voter issues today. But this is just not what the U.S. needs to be doing right now, period. Are we really wanting another fucking Cold War against an insane Russia? No thank you. It's gonna state. John McCain is dead. And based on who I'm seeing in my news feed, he was either an American hero or a traitor to conservatism. It is, interestingly, the liberals in my feed who are extolling the righteousness of McCain and comparing him to the obtuse in chief, saying that if Trump were a Republican like McCain, then they would all be behind him. The conservatives, who are all now, for the most part, Trumpeters, are saying McCain was a terrible Republican. But I wanted to take a minute and not look at McCain as a member of any particular political party or ideology, other than his membership as one of our rulers and a massive statist. So let's do that. First of all, there were few figures in recent American life who dedicated themselves so personally to the perpetuation of war and empire as John McCain. I'm sure you recall his statement that the U.S. could spend perhaps a hundred years meddling in the business of Iraq. He said, that'd be fine with me. McCain did not simply thunder for every major intervention of the post-Cold War era from the Senate floor while pushing for sanctions and assorted campaigns of subterfuge on the side. He was uniquely ruthless when it came to advancing imperial goals, 
Barnstorming from one conflict zone to another to personally recruit far-right fanatics as American proxies. In Libya and Syria, he cultivated affiliates of al-Qaeda as allies. And in Ukraine, McCain courted actual sig-heiling neo-Nazis. While McCain's Senate office functioned as a clubhouse for arms industry lobbyists and neocon operatives, his fascist allies waged a campaign of human devastation that will continue until long after the flowers dry up on his grave. American media may have sought to bury this legacy with the senator's body, but it is what much of the outside world will remember him for. McCain is less well known, though, for his boondoggles in Libya and Syria. In Libya, McCain met with the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, the LIFG, who were battling against Muammar Gaddafi. Shortly after this, Gaddafi's motorcade was attacked by NATO jets, which allowed LIFG fighters to capture him, sodomize him with a bayonet, and murder him, leaving his body to rot in a butcher shop. These same racist, sectarian militias recruited by McCain immediately then began a slaughter of black citizens of Libya. ISIS took control of Gaddafi's hometown, and a war of warlords began. Many might describe Libya as a failed state, but it also represents a successful realization of the vision McCain and his allies have advanced on the global stage. Following the NATO-orchestrated murder of Libya's leader, McCain tweeted, Gaddafi on his way out, Bashar al-Assad is next. McCain was proud of what he had helped Libya to become. Then, in Syria, McCain again stuck his nose in places where it shouldn't have been, giving legitimacy to a group of CIA-backed insurgents and blessing their struggle. To do so, he took under his wing a youthful D.C.-based Syria-American operative named Muaz Mustafa, who had been a consultant to the Libyan Transitional Council during the run-up to the NATO invasion. After McCain went to Syria, Mustafa said, the senator wanted to assure the free Syrian army that the American people support their cry for freedom, support their revolution. McCain's office promptly released a photo showing the senator posing beside a beaming Mustafa and two grim-looking gunmen. Days later, the men were named by the Lebanese Daily Star as Mohammed Nour and Abu Ibrahim. Both had been implicated in the kidnapping a year prior of 11 Shia pilgrims and were identified by one of their survivors. Yet, these were the allies McCain was courting. McCain ultimately failed to see the Islamist revolutionaries he glad-handed take control of Damascus. Syria's government held on thanks to help from his mortal enemies in Tehran and Moscow, but not before a billion-dollar CIA arm-and-equip operation helped spawn one of the worst refugee crises in post-war history. McCain then turned his attention to Ukraine. On December 14, 2013, McCain materialized in Kiev for a meeting with Ole Tienbach, an unreconstructed fascist who had emerged as a top opposition leader. Tienbach had co-founded the fascist Social National Party, a far-right political outfit that touted itself as the last hope of the white race, of humankind as such. No fan of Jews, he complained that a Muscovite Jewish mafia had taken control of his country and he had been photographed throwing up a Sieg Heil Nazi salute during a speech. None of this apparently mattered to McCain, nor did the scene of right sector neo Nazis filling up Kiev's Maiden Square while he appeared on stage to egg them on. McCain proclaimed to cheering throngs while Tienbach stood by his side Ukraine will make Europe better, and Europe will make Ukraine better. Six months later, McCain appeared at Dinopro One's training base alongside Senator Tom Cotton from Arkansas and John Barrasso. The people of my country are proud of your fight and your courage, McCain told an assembly of soldiers from the militia. When he completed his remarks, the fighters belted out a World War II-era salute made famous by Ukrainian Nazi collaborators called Glory to Ukraine. Today, far-right nationalists occupy key posts in Ukraine's pro-Western government. The Speaker of its Parliament is Andrea Perubla, a co-founder with Tyan Bach of the Social National Party and leader of the movement to honor World War II-era Nazi collaborators like Stephen Bandera. On the cover of his 1998 manifesto, View from the Right, Paraby appeared in a Nazi-style brown shirt with a pistol strapped to his waist. In June 2017, McCain and Republican Speaker of the House Paul Ryan welcomed Paraby on Capitol Hill for what McCain called a good meeting. The past months in Ukraine have seen a state-sponsored neo-Nazi militia called C-14 carrying out a pogromist rampage against Ukraine's Roma population, the country's parliament erecting an exhibition honoring Nazi collaborators, 
and the Ukrainian military formally approving the pro-Nazi Glory to Ukraine greeting as its own official salute. As far as I'm concerned, McCain's legacy is his ability to buddy up with terrorists and Nazis and use as many stolen resources as he could from the American taxpayer to fund their mayhem. McCain is a statist's statist. I am not horrible enough to dance on McCain's grave. However, I am glad there is one less statist in the U.S. Senate. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite director, Jessica, for her help with the show. For the show notes to this episode, where I put links and other information that's been on this show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 102. I have no new supporters this week, and sadly, I've lost several supporters in August. I'm down $18.50 per episode the first two weeks of August alone. Ouch. I'm wondering what I said to piss some folks off. So now would be a great time for you to help support this show, get us back on track. But thanks to all of my awesome supporters, I am still at $271 per episode or 54.2% of the way towards my next goal of $500 per episode. Thank you for all your support, guys. Really. Remember, when I hit this next goal, I will be upping the content I bring you from half an hour per week to a full hour. I know you want more content from me, and I want to give it to you. So add your pledge today to help me bring you twice the lava flow that you're getting today. So exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode using Federal Reserve notes through Patreon or Bitcoin through Coinbase. I want to be able to bring you more content soon, so make sure to add your donation today to help make that happen. I also have a couple of new Apple podcast reviews this week. Jesse Lawler said, Full immersion crash course. As a big podcast fan, I sometimes taste test communities I'm interested in by binging on a representative few podcasts. Lava Flow has been a great way for me to get the gist of what modern libertarianism and its related ideas are all about. Interesting, opinionated, and unapologetic. Absolutely. Thanks, Jesse, and I'm glad to see I'm reaching more than just the choir. I'm glad you're enjoying the show. Also, Terry T. said, Right versus Wrong. Roger will revive and help you maintain a strong sense of right versus wrong. The golden rule is not difficult to put into practice if you do not have a mental or social disorder. When a new podcast is released, it moves to the front of the list of the next one I am able to listen to. It is a little piece of sanity in the liberal, control-hungry environment that I live in. Terry, thank you so much for that. I'm glad I'm bringing you a bit of sanity each week. So if you have a minute and you want to hear your review on this show, please go to the lavaflow.com slash Apple and leave me a rating and a review. All the cool kids are doing it. Thank you to everyone who's left me a rating and review so far. You guys rock. To all of you who haven't had a chance, can you guys help me out and go leave a review for me? Go to the lavaflow.com slash Apple to do that now. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast. <laughs>